for the supreme enlightenment. And why? Because all such entities are empty through thirteen kinds of emptiness. And when he thus considers whereto he will dedicate, what he will dedicate and whereby he will dedicate, then his dedication will be actually effective. Furthermore he matures beings and acquires a Buddha field. He fulfills the perfection of giving, too the eighteen special Buddha dharmas. And from the very beginning he fulfills the perfection of giving without seizing on its reward. Just as the Paranamita Vasavatan gods satisfy all their needs by mind alone, so does the Bodhisattva. Through that gift he serves upon the Buddhas and lords, he gladdens the world with its gods, men and asuras, and establishes those beings in the triple vehicle through his having taken up that perfection of giving, as well as through his skill in means. It is thus that the Bodhisattva, coursing in perfect wisdom, fulfills the perfection of giving with a thought free from signs. And how does the Bodhisattva fulfill the perfection of morality? Here the Bodhisattva fulfills the perfection of morality while coursing in perfect wisdom. He acquires that morality which is holy, without outflows, which is included within the path, and which is acquired in the nature of things. And his morality becomes unimpaired, flawless, pure, untarnished, something which sets free from the slavery of craving, which is good to concentrate upon, and which has been lauded by the wise. And in respect of that morality he does not misconstrue any dharma, from form to the achievement of world rulership. But, having made this morality common to all beings, he dedicates it to the knowledge of all modes, by way of a dedication which is signless, baseless and non-dual, and which is also by way of worldly convention and not by way of ultimate reality. And through having fulfilled that perfection of morality, he produces through his skill in means the four trances without wishing to enjoy their fruits. He further achieves the heavenly eye. With that heavenly eye, relating to moral discipline, he sees the Buddhas and lords who in all the ten directions stand, hold, and maintain themselves, and who demonstrate Dharma. And he does not lose that vision before he has known full enlightenment. With the heavenly ear, pure and surpassing that of men, he hears the words of those Buddhas and lords when they preach the doctrine and he does not forget what he has heard before he has worked, as a result of what he has heard, the wheel of himself and of others. With the cognition of others' mental makeup he wisely knows with his own mind the mental processes of those Buddhas and Lords. And with the help of that cognition of others' mental makeup he works the wheel of all beings. With the help of the recollection of former lives he appraises the past merits of those beings. And through those meritorious deeds he still further encourages those beings, with the result that they become people of specific attainments. With the cognition of the extinction of the outflows he establishes beings in the fruits of the holy life, from that of a streamwinner to the supreme enlightenment. In fact he establishes beings in wholesome dharmas in accordance with their capabilities. It is thus that the Bodhisattva fulfills the perfection of morality with a mind free from signs. And how does he fulfill the perfection of patience, when dharmas are signless, impassive, baseless, and unaffected? Here the Bodhisattva, beginning with the first thought of enlightenment until he is seated on the terrace of enlightenment. Even if all beings should give him blows with clods, sticks, and swords, should not give an occasion to even one single thought associated with rage. In fact, the Bodhisattva should develop two kinds of patience. Which two? He should endure of all beings the abuse and revilings, as well as the blows with clods, sticks, and swords and he should also produce the patient acceptance of dharmas which fail to be produced. As to the first, the Bodhisattva should, when abused or reviled, or when he receives blows with clods, sticks, or swords. And to whom does he give these? He should contemplate the own being of all dharmas and, when he does so, he apprehends not even dharmas, how much less the own being of dharma itself. 
and when he contemplates the own being of Dharma, he thinks to himself, who cuts or breaks me? When he contemplates the own being of Dharma in this manner, then he acquires the patient acceptance of Dharmas which fail to be produced. And what is the patient acceptance of Dharmas which fail to be produced? It is of two kinds. The one results from the non-genesis of the defilements, and the other from the non-cutting off of cognition. Having stood in these two kinds of patience, he will fulfill the four trances, too. The eighteen special Buddha dharmas. Having stood in these dharmas which are holy, without outflows, supramundane, not shared by all the disciples and Pratyika Buddhas, he fulfills at the same time the holy supernologas. When he has fulfilled them he reaches the fullness of the six perfections. And when he has stood in the five supernologas which are without outflows, then he sees with his heavenly eye, in all the ten directions, the Buddhas and lords, and as a result he acquires the recollection of the Buddhas. And that Buddha recollection of his will not be cut off again before he knows full enlightenment. With the heavenly air he learns all that these Buddhas and lords have taught, and he thereupon teaches beings the Dharma just as it is. And he will understand with his own mind the mental processes of these Buddhas and lords. And after he has, through his cognition of others' mental makeup, understood with his own mind the mental processes of all beings, he will teach Dharma just as it is. After he has appraised, through his cognition of the recollection of former lives, the wholesome roots of those beings, he will, as a result of that former wholesome root, encourage them still further and through his cognition of the extinction of the outflows he will exhort those beings to the triple vehicle, and establish them therein. And that bodhisattva, coursing in perfect wisdom, will, through skill in means, mature beings, purify the Buddha field, and, coursing in the knowledge of all modes, he will, having fulfilled the knowledge of all modes and having won full enlightenment, turn the wheel of Dharma. It is thus that the Bodhisattva who courses in perfect wisdom fulfills the perfection of patience. How then does the Bodhisattva who courses in perfect wisdom fulfill the perfection of vigor, although dharmas are signless, impassive, baseless, non-manifest, and unaffected? Here the Bodhisattva, who courses in perfect wisdom, becomes endowed with physical vigor. He dwells having entered upon the four trances, one after the other. When he has achieved the fourth trance he experiences manifold wonderworking powers, too. With his hands he handles even the sun and moon, and up to the world of Brahma he holds sway with his body. Endowed with this physical vigor he travels, by means of his wonderworking powers, to the many hundreds of thousands of world systems in the ten directions where the Buddhas and lords dwell and he serves upon those Buddhas and lords with robes, arms, bowls, and his robes, arms, bowls, will not get exhausted before he knows full enlightenment. Then the world with its gods, men and asuras will become happy through these robes, arms, bowls, and when he has entered final nirvana his relics will be worshipped. Having travelled to other world systems by means of his wonder-working powers, he hears the Dharma from those Buddhas and Lords, and before he wins full enlightenment he will never again forget what he has heard. And he matures beings and acquires a Buddha field, while coursing in the knowledge of all modes. It is thus that the Bodhisattva, endowed with physical vigor, fulfills the perfection of vigor. And how, then, does the Bodhisattva fulfill the perfection of vigor when he is endowed with a mental vigor which takes place on the holy path without outflows and is included in the path? Here the Bodhisattva, who courses in perfect wisdom and is endowed with mental vigor, give no opportunity to unwholesome deeds of body or speech. He does not misconstrue anything whatsoever as permanent, or impermanent ease, or ill, self, or not-self, conditioned, or unconditioned, be it the world of sense-desire, the world of form or the formless world, the element without flows or the element without outflows, 
or the transit concentrations, or friendliness, compassion, sympathetic joy or impartiality, or the formless concentrations, or the applications of mindfulness, to the Buddha Dharmas. Nor does he misconstrue the fruits of the holy life, from the fruit of a stream winner to bodhisattvahood, as permanent or impermanent. And he does not mistakenly say that these beings have been exalted by vision. Those by the stage of refinement. Those by the removal of the lower fetters, those by the removal of the higher fetters, those by Pratyika Buddhahood, or by the knowledge of the modes of the path or by the knowledge of all modes. And why? Because there does not exist the own being of all these states by which they the beings could be exalted. Endowed with this mental vigor even at the time of his dying he works the wheel of beings, but without apprehending them. He fulfills the perfection of vigor, but does not apprehend it. He fulfills the Buddha Dharmas, but does not.